Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. I'd like to solve a couple of problems related to heat transfer. Um, heat transfer problems. Now, this lecture is part of the course uh, Physics for Teens presented on Unizor.com. Uh, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from uh, the website because together with the video presentation you will have the text, basically like a textbook, in front of you with all the formulas, calculations, etc. So it's very beneficial. And um, the, the site is completely free, there are no advertisements, so you don't even have to um, sign in if you don't want to take exams, but if you want to challenge yourself, please do. Uh, okay, so let's get to the problems. So, uh, I would like to solve the problems in, in general uh, with some unknown variables basically describing the physical um, uh, objects we are dealing with. And then maybe if I, if I have time I will use some concrete numbers to basically do whatever it is. If not, the numbers will be in the text part of this lecture just for a calculation purpose, so that's not a very important thing. What's important thing is to approach the problems in their general uh, sense and understanding. So my first problem is, let's consider you have a room uh, which is supposed to be of certain temperature, so you have a certain temperature of the room, and there is an outside world which has its own temperature. My purpose is to maintain a concrete difference between outside temperature and inside temperature. So, for instance, I would like my room to be, let's say, 15 degrees of Celsius, uh, of Celsius uh, higher than, than the outer temperature, okay? So, this delta is given, all right? So, based on um, temperature outside, uh, knowing the delta, we can always calculate what will be the room temperature, but in any case, I would like to be dependent only on this delta. So, if you have a room at certain temperature, you have outside at certain, at certain temperature, my purpose is to find out how much heat we are losing because of the difference in temperature, uh, which necessitates, uh, if I would like to maintain the constant room temperature, to have a source of heat inside the room of the same amount of heat uh, which we are losing through um, conductivity of the, uh, of the wall, which separates. So, I assume that the room is perfectly insulated from all the sides, except one which is facing uh, the outside world. And uh, to make my life easier, I assume that this wall is just solid, a uh, wall of some substance of, of, of the same uh, thickness and, and, and certain area. So uh, all I need this information for. So I need the area of the room, which is A. I need thickness of the room, which is L. And uh, I need the thermal conductivity, conductivity, which is K. So, this is a relatively simple problem related to heat transfer and it has practical uh, applications as well. So, I know what kind of a uh, difference in temperature I would like to maintain. I know where actually the heat is going. It's going through this wall which has the area of uh, A and the thickness of the wall is L and it's made of some solid material uh, which has certain um, coefficient of conductivity, thermal conductivity. Okay, so to maintain this type of a um, condition, temperature here, temperature there, etc., I will introduce a function. So let's consider this is my wall, this is a room, this is outside, 
and uh, I will introduce the point X which is a difference from let's say from the room to any point inside the wall because the, the heat actually is sipping through this wall from this surface to that surface right this is um, assume, let, let's assume that the room temperature is, is higher than the outer temperature so the heat goes this way now uh, I would like to determine the function what is the temperature at each point from the inside surface to the outside surface now first of all I I think it's reasonable to assume that considering this is a solid wall which means the penetration of the heat is exactly the same on each layer of this wall I have to assume that this function is linear depending on X the thicker the wall obviously the temperature would be closer and closer to T out and on this surface T of 0 is equal to T room and T of L because the thickness of the wall is L is T out and in between from 0 to L my function T of X should be linear and I can determine the coefficients uh, alpha and beta very easy, easily from these two so if I substitute um, 0 for x, I will have basically alpha, which is equal to t room. And if I substitute L, I will have um, t out equals alpha, which is t room, plus beta times L, right? From which L is equal to... Uh, T out minus T room divided by L uh, I mean beta is equal to well quite frankly I would like uh, everything to be uh, well in this case beta is negative as you see but so it's minus delta but if I will define delta the other way around which probably is better because I'm starting from this point from the room so this is the starting point this is the ending point so usually probably would be better if I will consider delta to be negative in which case I don't have to I don't have to carry this sign so the sign is inside delta is negative in this case all right so I know basically this so T of X is equal to uh, T room plus T out minus T room divided by L X correct so if X is equal to 0 this is 0 I will have T room and if X is equal to L I have this is 1 L divided by L T room and T room will cancel and I will have T out so these conditions are actually satisfied I don't need them anymore now I have my function temperature as a function uh, of the distance from the surface facing the room well if this is the beginning then that's how it goes okay so I know the temperature that's good now if I have uh, two layers let's say uh, with different temperatures obviously the heat goes through this and we have the law of uh, Fourier which basically states that the rate of um, heat transfer from one layer to another the rate in terms of per unit of time 
and per unit of area. Depends basically only on two things, on the temperature and uh, the uh, conductivity. So it's basically equals to minus K times uh, my um, derivative of, of, the, of the temperature. Basically, if you start, if you start from, uh, uh, instead of differential, if you will use uh, just an increment, delta, you will increment from x to uh, x plus delta x, which will basically give you the similar formula with delta x, and then you divide it bo both by, by delta x and go to a li <coughs> limit when delta x is going to zero, and you will have this um, Fourier law. Fourier. Which was discussed in one of the previous le uh, lessons. Now, let's recall this is the function of x, which means this is also a function of x. So again, this is how much heat goes through the unit of surface per unit of time. Okay, <coughs> now why is it minus here? Let's just think about it. The heat goes from left to right, which means we are basically uh, transferring the heat towards this. Now, this uh, temperature, temperature is, we are assuming this is cooler, uh, this is warmer and this is cooler. So, uh, the temperature of X is um, going down, so the, uh, the derivative is negative, so negative and negative will be positive, so we are losing that much of heat. That's what's very important, we are losing this much of heat. Okay, now it's uh, amount of heat which we're losing per unit of time, per unit of area. Now, what's our area? Well, area is A, which means that uh, uh, I can actually multiply it by A to get total amount of uh, heat which we are losing through this area, right? Now, what is the derivative? Well, derivative of this function, well, this is a constant, so it goes out, derivative is this, right? It's a linear function, so derivative is basically this coefficient, which is delta, by the way. So, I can say that this is equal to minus k uh, delta, and now I have to multiply it by a, because, again, this is per unit of area, and I have the whole wall separating room from the outside world, so I have to multiply by the area of the wall. So, this is, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, it's not delta, it's delta d divided by L, so it's like this. So, what basically this states is that the loss of the heat per unit of time is constant. You see, it doesn't depend on x, because this is a linear function. And obviously it's a linear function because our wall is solid and consists of exactly the same material. That's why it's linear. If it's different, something, something like the layer of insulation, then maybe the brick, maybe another layer of insulation or something like this, then obviously this will not be a linear function. So I have kind of simplified my job, assuming this is just a solid material, solid wall. But in this case, this is the formula. And by the way, I have calculated in one particular case when the wall is made of concrete, and we know the, um, the um, con uh, conduction of, of, the, uh, of the cement wall or concrete wall, whatever. Um, so we know the delta, let's say, delta is inside 20 degrees Celsius, outside is, let's say, 5 degrees Celsius. It's the winter time in, in northern semi, uh, hemisphere. So we have difference of 15 degrees. The area of the wall, well, again, let's say 4 by 3 meters, like 12 meters square. Width of the wall is, let's say, 20 centimeters, which is 0.2 in my example. And I calculated what's the, basically, 
uh, amount of heat which we are losing per unit of time. And my calculations show it's about 540 watts. So this means we need a source of heat, uh, the heater of this type of a power for the uh, amount of heat we are, we are losing through this one wall. Now obviously in real practical situations we are not really losing through one particular wall. We might actually have some conductivity to other places. Well, maybe not if they are on the same temperature level. Uh, usually we have windows in the room which definitely complicate the picture so the transfer through the window should be calculated separately from the transfer from the other parts of the wall plus the wall is not really a solid uniform material so we probably have non-linear function here it all depends and it all can be calculated slowly uh, boringly <laughs> unfortunately but it can be done using exactly the same strategy all you have to do is basically separate your bigger problem into a set of smaller problems. Window is one thing, uh, wall is another thing, layer of uh, insulation is the third thing, etc. So you can calculate very slowly, separately, each of these guys, and then you will still have the final result, which is how much heat you need to warm up this room. Okay, that's my first problem. Now, my problem number two was actually the same problem with calculation, which I have just skipped and gave you the result, 540. And now I will go to my third problem. Also, I will do it in general case first, and I'm not sure I will go into the calculations for specific things. So, my next problem is related to, again, a very practical uh, situation of... Uh, Let's say you have uh, a hot tea kettle, just boil the water, you have your drink, and then it's basically standing on the stove and cooling down, slowly cooling down. I would like to know what is exactly the temperature of this tea kettle uh, as a function of a time, as it goes. Now, obviously, you understand from just general intuitive um, uh, logic that in the beginning when the kettle is very hot the amount of uh, heat which uh, it uh, emits into the room using the convection of the air is probably higher than if it's already cooled down and it's almost the same temperature as the air so I was also kind of thinking about what is the graph of the function temperature as a function of time. Well, I was thinking that it should be something like this. So this is basically the level of uh, room temperature and this is the level of temperature of the uh, of the tea kettle. So let's say in the beginning it's 100 degrees Celsius which means we just boiled it and then it's basically slowly um, sl uh, slow go goes down. First a little faster and then slower and slower. So that's what I was thinking which reminds me obviously the exponential function and I basically want to find out if it's really kind of exponential. Well um, somebody told me a joke that in the real world everything is exponential and if not exponential is logarithmic which is inverse function. Okay, jokes aside, let's just try to uh, apply the theory of convection to this particular situation. Now, I would like to simplify my job. Again, it's very typical for physicists. First, they model the real world. Um, and then they realize that the model is not actually the same as real world. They're trying to complicate it more and more until it may be closer and closer to the real world. But right now, I would like to, 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 to really simplify my, my, my work, my, my, my problem, down to a very uh, kind of a palatable um, case. Now, let's just think about, if this is a real tea kettle, well, it has a metal outside, it, it has some remnants of the water, whatever we have not used for tea, um, which means, obviously, it's 
complicated. I mean, first you have the convection towards uh, the air, then uh, it's not immediately, whatever you lost your, your, your heat from the surface of this uh, tea kettle doesn't immediately actually uh, go, doesn't immediately cool down the inside, the water, so maybe there is a convection inside of the tea kettle as well. So complicated, too complicated. We are not considering this. My consideration is much, much, much simpler. Instead of a tea kettle in the air, I will have a thin square object um, of certain temperature, let's say T of T, that would be the temperature of this as the time goes. Obviously uh, T of zero should be given uh, in case of a tea kettle right after it, it, it boiled the, the water, it would be 100 degrees uh, Celsius. But in any case, there is some kind of an initial temperature. Then around this, there is some kind of a substance, I don't care what, whatever it is, liquid or, or gas, which basically um, is uh, taking the heat out from this uh, uh, thin square, and the temperature of outside is constant. I assume this substance has uh, TS temperature because the outside is very large, infinitely large. In my model, the outside world is infinitely large, which means whatever the, temp whatever the heat this thing um, emits, it, it it's completely dissipates and doesn't really change this temperature. Because if it does, it's another complication, and I have to take it into account, which is, again, not, not very difficult, but I would like to simplify this job, my job. Um, so, we have this infinitely large outside substance, which, you, it, it, which is used like a sink for the heat. The heat goes from here, and it dissipates immediately using the convection. Now, for instance, this is water, like ocean, right? And this is just a hot square of L by L, and it has certain mass, M. Now, why did I um, specify that it's very thin? Well, because if it's very thin, then the cooling of the surface here or here, on the upper or, or on the uh, lower part, immediately affects the whole object. And the thinner it is, the faster the heat actually is um, propagated. I mean, loss of the heat is actually propagated inside. And I don't really have to take into account the conductivity within this particular um, object. Again, simplification from the real life. If I will have, let's say, a, a cube, then I will have to take into account that whatever my heat is dissipated um, from the outside, it will take some time for the entire object to cool down. So again, no such complication. My um, square is infinitely thin, which means my heat is immediately uh, affecting the temperature from the outside of this object, immediately um, uh, conducted through the whole object. That's why it is thin. Okay, that's good. Now, what else do I need? Uh, I have dimensions. All right, I think it's time we, we can actually start um, calculating. Oh, yes, I do need something more. I need um, specific, specific heat capacity uh, of the object, which is C. Because obviously, if this is, let's say, a piece of metal, then it will cool down during one particular uh, time and uh, according to one particular law. But if it's a piece of, uh, let's say, wood uh, or plastic, then the, probably the things will be different. Okay.
So I need the specific heat capacity. Now, the way how I approach this problem is the following. During certain um, amount of time, delta T, I will have certain amount of heat based on this temperature and this temperature, temperature of the object and temperature of the outside substance. I will have certain amount of, time, uh, of, of heat dissipated. At the same time, since we have lost this amount of, uh, of, uh, of heat, the temperature of the object must be lowered. Now, if I know by how much my temperature has changed, I can calculate how much heat we have lost because I have this heat capacity. And, uh, uh, and the mass. Right? So knowing mass and heat capacity and knowing the difference between two temperatures before and after this period, I can know how much I lose. At the same time, since I know the temperature and outside temperature of object and temperature outside, using the convection uh, laws, uh, I can calculate how much this substance actually took uh, heat. E and if I will basically just equate one to another, I will have certain equation um, based on which I can determine what is my function t. Alright? That, that's a general, general approach. So amount of heat lost by the object should be equal to amount of heat consumed by convection in the substance. Okay, so let's calculate one and another. And let's not pay attention to the sign, because one probably is positive, another is negative, doesn't really matter right now, because when we equate them, that would be, or, I mean, we can, alwe we can always say that, okay, they are positive and negative, but their sum is equal to zero. Same thing, all right? Doesn't really matter. So I assume that this object is hotter, and the substance is uh, cooler, so my heat goes from the object to the outside uh, substance. Okay, so first of all, first of all, I will use the difference between these two temperatures and uh, the law of convection um, to calculate how much heat we actually consumed by outside um, substance. And for this, I need H, which is this substance, um, how is it called, I think I have the name, convection heat transfer coefficient. Convection heat transfer coefficient, because this is needed for basically calculating how much heat will be um, consumed by the substance through the convection. Now, as you remember from one of the previous lectures, the amount of heat uh, per unit of time, per unit of area, so the heat transfer rate, rate, rate if you wish, depends on this um, convection heat transfer coefficient. <laughs> convection heat transfer coefficient and the difference between the temperatures. So the temperature of the object is this, temperature of substance is this. All right? That's what happens. Now, if I have this rate of heat transfer using the conductivity, but my object has certain area through which this heat is transferred, because this is per unit of uh, time per unit of uh, area. So I have to multiply it by area, which is uh, L squared times 2, right? 2 L squared. That would be the total amount of heat which substance around this object is consuming using the convection. All right? Provided this uh, coefficient of uh, uh, heat transfer through the convection. 
So this is my amount of heat which I have consumed by the substance around uh, this object. Now let's think about what happens um, during the time whatever was happening. Now this is the rate. So I was talking about let's have certain amount of time delta t and to calculate how much we have um, consumed during this period of time I just have to multiply it by delta t. So this is the amount of heat energy consumed by uh, my outside world, outside substance, during the time delta t from the surface which has area 2L square, top and bottom, 2L square, right? We're assuming this is a square and very thin square. Now this is the temperature. Um, now if my delta t is really small, I can assume that the uh, temperature is um, constant during this period of time. I mean, that's a general assumption in all the calculus. So we are assuming that, that the de delta t or uh, increment of the argument is relatively small, so the function doesn't really change much during this increment. And then we will go to, to a limit when, when delta t goes to zero, and then it would be uh, the regular um, kind of an assumption. Now, let's calculate how much um, we have, well, we calculated how much we lost, but now, uh, during the same amount of time, if we know that we have lost temperature from T, T to T of T plus delta T, we are going to differential equa equations, as you understand. Now, so, during this period of time, the function, this function, gives me change of the temperature. Now, if temperature has changed in the object itself, considering I know the um, specific heat capacity and mass, you know that um, the amount of um, heat which I have lost would be T of T plus delta T minus, minus T of T. That's the difference of temperature. This is how much we have lost. Now if we will multiply it by specific heat capacity and mass, that would be amount of heat which we have lost, right? To increase, if you remember, to increase the temperature by a unit of temperature, by, by, by a unit of temperature we need um, amount of uh, well, object, the, the mass of the object and specific heat capacity. That basically the definition of specific heat, heat capacity. So these two are supposed to be equal. That's what the most important part of it. Okay? From which Everything follows very, very easily. If you divide this equation by delta t, you will have um, C times M times T of T plus delta T minus T of T divided by delta T equals to 2L square H T of T minus T S. Ts is a constant. That's the substance around the uh, object temperature. And obviously, you understand, we go to a limit with delta t goes to zero, in which case this is basically a definition of the derivative. Dt of t. By the way, differential equations, derivatives, um, whatever, whatever the calculus actually has in its uh, uh, chest of tools, these are the major tools used in physics. Everywhere you will see 
differentials, uh, derivatives, differential equations, etc., etc. The whole physics is based on this. Well, the whole apparatus of calculus was invented for the purposes of the physics by Newton and Leib Leibniz and, and followers. And some people even say that the whole mathematics is just part of the uh, physics. But, okay, let's not go into this, but in any case, this is obviously a nice and very simple differential equation which I'm going to solve right now and you will see where the exponential comes from. Okay. First of all, let me simplify my, my work. Uh, I don't like all... These are all constant. This is a constant which is the um, specific heat capacity of the object, whatever it's made of. Uh, this is the mass. It's also given. This is um, uh, convection heat transfer coefficient of the surrounding substance. And this is the, uh, the, the dimension of the, of the object. It's a square L by L, right? So let me just put all of them together. So I will put something like 2L square H divided by C times M. Let's call it uh, alpha, whatever. Now, next thing, I will simplify it. X of T is equal to T of T minus TS, this thing. It's simpler if I will put it x of t. Why? Because dx of t by dt is equal to dt of t by dt. Because this is a constant, right? So you subtract the constant from the function, doesn't change its derivative. So this equation can be rewritten as now dt per dt is the same as dx per dt equals to alpha times x of t. Much simpler, right? And obviously we can solve it very easily. We put dt over there and xt over here, so we have dx of t uh, to x of t equals alpha t dt. And now we can integrate it. Now what is this? Well, this is derivative of logarithm, right? So it's logarithm of x of t plus constant is equal to alpha t. Now this is, I don't want to use c, c is already used somewhere, whatever the constant is, beta. All right, so since it's just any kind of free constant, whatever it is, we can put it here as well, same thing, plus minus, doesn't matter, it's just any constant because we are integrating, right, it's a indefinite integral. All right, so we will define the coefficient beta a little bit later. Now obviously I have to resolve it for x of t by doing what? By raising e to this uh, logarithm of f, f of x and I will have f of x of t is equal to e to the power of uh, alpha t times, again, this is any kind of a constant, so it's just another coefficient times gamma, right? Because we are raising to the power, so that's why it's multiplication here. All right, now, alpha, we know what alpha actually is. It's a, uh, what is it? It's two, L square H divided by CM. Okay. 
well actually I had to put a minus I, I was talking about minus and, and plus uh, sign so we basically understand that this is a negative thing because the temperature goes down right so um, the only thing is we don't know what gamma is right well we can obviously determine it by substituting t is equal to zero when t is equal to zero at the beginning of the time this is one and the temperature x of zero is equal to x zero I was talking about this in the very beginning that's the beginning from which we start cooling our object right so that's basically what gamma is right uh, I, I think I called it t zero not x zero all right so basically we have solved everything and our answer to our problem is um, x of t well instead of x of t I will use now this t of t minus t s equals to this coefficient um, this well that's not exactly true x of t is equal to hold on t of 0 minus t s right which means t0 minus ts that's what gamma is i'm sorry so i have t0 minus ts times e to the power of um, again what is it minus 2l square h divided by cm t oh, t to the power So here is our exponent. Now, if you wish, you can write it differently. We need okay, that would be easier. Again, if t is equal to zero, this is one, which means my sum would be t s plus t zero minus t s. So I will have t zero. So at time t is equal to zero, my temperature is. Um, equal to t0 now if t is equal to infinity um, e to the power minus infinity is 0 right well obviously we are talking about limits right when t is uh, indefinitely increasing now this is going to 0 which means my temperature eventually as the t is increasing will be closer and closer to this this component will be closer to zero so my uh, temperature will be close and closer to uh, temperature of the surrounding area but in any uh, finite moment of time it will not be equal so we need infinity actually so in the infinity my kettle will cool down to exactly the temperature of the surrounding air but obviously after significant amount of time the temperature of the kettle will be insignificantly uh, greater than the temperature of the outside air and we can actually completely disregard this difference but anyway this is the confirmation of our original logical kind of thinking that the graph is supposed to be something like this but this is t s and this is t zero the temperature will go down um, asymptotically approaching the temperature of the surrounding substance okay that's it um, obviously we can put maybe I will put it in in the textual part of this lecture some calculation for a concrete case uh, but in any case this is a very important um, problem in that respect that it's using the laws which we already know which means the law of conductivity 
and the law of uh, convection and the heat capacity and we are using a good mathematical apparatus of differential equations so just one more confirmation to whatever I was talking all the time that on the same unizor.com website there is a math for teens course which is a prerequisite the math is a prerequisite for the physics course so make sure you know everything whatever is in that course all right that's it for today thank you very much and good luck